Welcome to the Life Writing Podcast, where married authors and screenwriters Stephen Barnes and Tanana Reeve do talk about writing during stressful times, breaking into Hollywood, and balancing life. Every week, we'll share more tips on how to build a better life while you create your dream projects. Even if it's only at the rate of one sentence a day. Life writing is the application of the tools of writing to life and the tools of life to your writing. Yay, here we are. Hey. Hi, everybody. Woo. So excited, as always. As always. Sharing this time with you. Because life life is exciting. And this, you know, you just, I never know from one week to the next what's going to be happening and what, therefore, we're going to have a chance to talk to our audience about. And this week is no different. Uh, May has been a very uh, interesting month so far, to say the least. There's been a lot happening. Yeah, it's and like that 2022 is ramping up. It really is. It really is. And, you know, I noticed a lot of people are out and about. Please be safe out there because I'm also hearing a lot of anecdotal stories about uh, COVID. People well, getting COVID, COVID. COVID rates are climbing. However, mortalities are continuing to drop. So what we have now seems to be equivalent to the worst flu I ever heard of in my life, as opposed to COVID, which was a different kettle of fish. So people are still gonna die and you can still get sick and you can still pass it to others, but we're starting to get more of a grasp on this. I think some people are like sort of taking that risk now. They're like, I know I could get COVID, but man, I wanna go to Stoker Con or whatever the event right. is. <laughs> So, which, you know, and there were, I'm hearing stories of people who had COVID at StokerCon, but I think it's like sort of weighing, like it's with me in movies. It's like, am I going to risk getting COVID to see this movie as opposed to that movie? And it was really interesting. We saw the new Doctor Strange movie. I think it was a Monday night and that theater was empty. Yes. We, weren't we the only people, if we weren't the only people. No, that, there were, I think, three other people in the theater and we were all spaced far from each other. These are people, these are my tribe. <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was like a private screening, but you know, I'm, I'm hearing that the, the second week drop off was pretty steep. And even when I was there Monday with that small crowd, I thought, ooh, theaters are probably uh, struggling a little bit right now, but, but as long as we love movies, there are movies that we're willing to take that risk for. And I always wear my mask and I try not to be eating popcorn through the whole movie. So uh, that way I have my mask on. <laughs> so, so let's talk about, you know, kind of what has been going on this week because it fits directly into the into the topic. Our, our, what, is our, what is your title for our topic today? Well, writing in the multiverse on basically learning creative flow and flexibility and adaptation, like all those different kinds of writing. And, and this week was a really good example of that because I'm working on a short story. Uh, we're awaiting word on a television pilot pitch that is adapted from a novel. And this week, Steve, you got a very special treat because you got to see some pages. Why don't you tell the audience what you got to see? Well, not before I do that, before I do that, I'll say that my title for today's show is Story is Story. You know, just really get, you understand the root of it and all the different forms of it are just the flowering. Uh, and it, it's, it's critical not to make the mistake of thinking that they're horribly different things. So, you know, hopefully we're going to shift your perspective. You listen to this episode by the end of it. Hopefully you're going to look at the question of what it is you're trying to do a little differently. So this week, yeah, I got some pages from a, a, a graphic novel that I did. Um, and uh, tell us about what it is. What's the project? It's, well, do you think we can, we can. Yeah, yeah. It, it, they okay. made an announcement this week. Okay. It's so, DC. so mine, I was working through uh, Reggie Hudlin and uh, DC Comics. Uh, it's a, a history thing. Uh, was it Legends of History? What, what's the, what's the title of it? Milestone Media's Milestones in History Anthology. Yeah. And mine had to do with the Conqueror Hannibal. Uh, Hannibal. Uh, and I had done research for this years back when we were trying to do a Hannibal series at BET with Vin Diesel, which did not work out arguably for the same reason that Justin Lin just dropped out of the Fast 10 movie. Do you know that for a fact? I said possibly, I said <laughs> possibly. And I didn't go any further than that either. Um, but uh, I want, 
you know, it, it's always interesting, just as with Eightfold Path, I didn't know what the art was going to look like. And the art is is part of the story, an integral part of the story. And it can make or break you. And um, just as with Eightfold Story, when I looked at the art here, uh, my mind was blown. You know, I just felt like, oh, my God, the, this is this is as close to perfect as I could ask for. Um, and it. This story deals with a uh, Hannibal crossing the Alps. We'll we'll we'll, we'll put that. We'll, we'll we'll say that. And the art seemed to be completely appropriate. It really did convince me that yes, graphic novels are a a, a thing that I want to do more of in the future. Um, and I, and I have to shout out the amazing artists. There are two listed for your comic, honey. Ron Wilson and Mike Gustavich mm -hmm. are the artists. And that art, woo, leaps off the page. Just to jump in, I did a, a story about Alexander Dumas and his family, really his father, who was a general under Napoleon. I didn't know that. <laughs> and also his son, who later became a playwright. And my art is by uh, J Jamal Eigel and Chris Sotomayor. So, I, you know, we were both thrilled with the art. Yeah, you know, and, and conversations are ongoing about what we might do next here, just as they're ongoing with uh, John Jennings and, uh, and Megascope. In terms of what we might do there so knowing that there are multiple venues for particular media in graphic novels would be considered a, a media um just as you know the television things we have a television show uh development deal that we finished negotiating and uh will be signing the contract on fairly soon and then there is uh one that we got back from a studio uh, that somebody else immediately inquired about. Yeah. We have... Pretty assertively, so yeah. Pretty assertively. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. have a podcast, dramatic podcast, that we um, have a very strong possibility. The, the people that we're talking to there are very happy and mm -hmm. want to take it to Audible. You know, so we need to develop that more more thoroughly over the next week. I, I literally, if I can interrupt for a second, yes, please. I literally did a little dance as I was thinking about that meeting, because one of the notes back was, you know, think of ways you can make sure that this part of the story or this scene fits audible, you know, audio storytelling. What does it sound like? And I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I'm learning how to think and sound like scenes and sound. I just got so excited. I was like, I love learning. Well, I wanted to say that of the things that you said on that call, what impressed me the most was when you were talking about the ambient sound cues that we mm. would use in different locations. You know, I was just pulling it out of the air. This, this, <laughs> this area, we can use this kind of sound. And in this area over here, we can use this kind of sound. And I was sitting back thinking, that's my baby. Yes, because you know, I that, love that was, podcasts. That was, that was great. So um, we have that, and then there is a, a movie that a major studio asked us to pitch a movie based on something in their library. Uh, and I took a look at what they offered us, and I was not overwhelmed with most of them, but there was, because, because these were like their some of their B movies. These were not their A movies in that particular category. I'm being yeah, we're not getting those offers here. yet. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm vague booking here, folks. Um, and But one of them was of interest and it yes. triggered some things in me and i came up with a great four letter pitch four word pitch that i will not offer no, no, the public not here, not no, here. i'm not going to not yet. rose but you'd snip it out i know i just said it but you didn't get to hear it because tanana reef took it out she um, he's just fake <laughs> rose budding <laughs> um <laughs> That's our audio cue for people who don't know. If you ever hear the word rosebud, usually in this podcast, it means it got in by accident because that means we were supposed to cut it out. <laughs> and now I'll be editing this and there'll be so many extra ones confusing me, but that's okay. <laughs> so um, I came up with a pitch and I pitched it to Tanana and she loved the idea. And I've already created like a 13 page treatment uh, of the potential idea. And we're going to be pitching it to this studio uh, in June, I believe. Yes, and yes. I already know if they don't like it, I'm going to file the serial numbers off of it and write it anyway. Yeah, we'll write it anyway. Yeah, it's a great a idea. idea. It's super fun. And our philosophy is we should always be working on a spec script. Remember what Rodney Barnes said that, you know, it doesn't matter. What did even he say? If, 
Pretty if easy. you're an experienced television writer, even someone like him, he'd done Everybody Hates Chris. He had done Boondocks. But people don't care what you wrote before. They want to know what's your voice and your spec work. And it's and in TV, it's collaborative. So, you know, you might have written the script, but did you really write the script? You know what I mean? So a spec script is what really demonstrates your voice to execs. And that's what they want to see is spec scripts. That's what he said. So what have we talked about here? We've talked, we talked about, and also I'm working on a short story with Larry Niven. So we've talked about short stories. We've talked about podcasts. We've talked about uh, podcasts. We're, we're doing a podcast right now. Uh, I'm actually planning to start another one on the warrior's journey. Um, Which is, and explain a little bit what that is. So you know, the, warrior, the warrior's journey is a program that we have that helps people deal with fear, especially artists dealing with psychological fear. It, 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 it teaches the, the mental and emotional sets of the advanced martial artists to people who don't have 30 years to practice, but right. still need to deal with their fear now. And you can check that out at realwarriorsjourney.com. But I had been having weekly conversations with my karate master, Steve Muhammad, and had started realizing that the wisdom that he was offering on those podcasts, on, on those conversations, I needed to record them, not just you know, for myself uh, and for my son when he decides to get back into martial arts. But then I thought, well, why not just record them and, and, and start creating a different podcast that would enable me to talk about the, the martial arts aspect of my life and, and all that it has contributed to to everything. I mean, it's, so it's, it's, I don't know how often I'll do it, but I do know that it's a, a, a new thing. So, and then there's the movie that we want to work on. And then there's a television series we want to work on. So you realize that there are like five different things, you know, short story, novel, uh, podcast, television, and movie. There are five different things. Now, there are two different things that have to be done, at least. One is, how do you keep track of all the different projects? And how do you keep track within a given project of all the different steps and the things that you have to do in order to complete it on an external deadline? So we'll talk more about those things later, but that's that's one family of things. The other family of things is just the, oh darn, how, 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 would, how would I put it? If you've got all the different projects and they're in different media, does that require completely different thought patterns? I say that if you think about story properly, all of these different things are just different branches on the same tree. I'm going to go one step farther than that, honey. I'm going to make a promise to you listeners that by the end of this podcast, we're not saying you have to do everything we're doing and you have to spread yourselves out as over as many genres and platforms, but I can guarantee you that you will see more creative outlets for your work than maybe you had thought about previously. Mm -hmm. um, some of you are already doing what we're doing and you're multiversing with your writing, but if you haven't thought about, huh, should I write a graphic novel? Huh, maybe I wanna write a, a, a scripted podcast. Listen, by the end of this podcast, you're gonna have a much better idea of how you too can learn to write in the multiverse. And this is critically important because there are people who think that, well, I only have, I, my ideas come out in the shape of novels. No, the, the treatment of an idea comes out in the shape of a novel. Th that same idea could be a short story. It could be a movie. It could probably, you know, birth a television series. It could probably be, you know, a, a graphic novel or a podcast. The, if you look at them all as being different expressions of the same idea, um, like the sun can cast shadows of many shapes and water can fit into many different containers. If you will use, you know, what the life writing process is looking at the hero's journey, both as the structure of story and the process of creating story and the process of designing your career, if you will use that single tool and learn how to use it in those different ways, when, an open, when a door opens, if you're writing short stories and you have a great idea, you'll be able to do that novel. If somebody says, listen, I'm, I'm interested in doing a podcast, you'll be able to think, oh, I can adapt my idea so that I can go through that door. You listen for what the opportunities are. If you will do that, your chances of having professional success are vastly larger than someone who is stuck in doing one thing one way and they think that's the only thing they can do and the only thing that will make them happy. 
I, and I want to say I was that person. <laughs> okay. Uh, I will admit like even something that relatively small, like I spent 10 years as a journalist for the Miami Herald. And yes, in my spare time, I was working on my fiction, but deep down I wanted to write for a magazine, you know? And it doesn't seem like that big of a shift between writing for a newspaper and writing for a magazine, but because I just didn't know where to begin. I didn't know people to ask. I didn't know how to get advice. I didn't have any contacts in magazine writing. I literally never ever pursued it. It was a mystery to me. Uh, just like in the beginning, screenwriting was a complete, the formatting alone was a complete mystery to me. And it was only because producers started to come to me and I got kind of pushed and Steve had done some screenwriting that it became demystified. And I learned, oh, I can also be a screenwriter. So if you've ever felt stuck in one kind of writing because of that mystification factor, you definitely are not alone. I have been through it. I'm still probably going through it. There are things like playwriting I've never pursued. Again, it's a mystery. Yeah, I think that I remember the first time we had that conversation, there was a, a mythology in some creative writing classes that you know, short story writing and novel writing are completely different things. You know, and my attitude is really, are they as different as, as snails and puppy dogs tails? I mean, really, are they completely different or are they different branches on the same, on the same tree? My attitude is very similar to, uh, I guess, Chris Soth, uh, who has a, uh, a theory, he's a, a writing instructor, has a theory called uh, Soth's fractal, that the basic pattern of story is what it is, but in a short story, you might repeat that basic pattern once, one time. Whereas in a novel, it repeats in in sequential and sequential form, one sequ one sequence after another, but also in meta form that the entire book represents in it one single large action in this character's life or in the lives of these characters. Um, you know, even though there are countless. Uh, vignettes within the Lord of the Rings trilogy, the large action is Frodo taking the ring to Mordor. You know, that that's, that's the big action that holds all of these, all of this together. Um, that once you begin to, you know, this is what, where, why we try to drill that within the, within our life writing program, understand the hero's journey, how it relates to a story, to the process of writing a story, to the process of creating your career or the process of living your life. So you can see, you start seeing the same tool in multiple things rather than needing a completely different tool. You don't use one style of story structure for horror and another for Westerns and another for science fiction. There are basics underneath these things. Yeah, they absolutely are. And, you know, one example that comes to mind for me is a graphic novel we have coming out this fall called The Keeper, which is a horror graphic novel. Steve and I co-wrote it, adapted from a screenplay with, and the artist is Marco Finnegan. So it really started as a script. We were working on a treatment, figuring out the story, I think maybe we were just about ready to start writing the script or had just started writing the script when I got an opportunity to submit a short story to Fangoria magazine. They asked me for a story. I didn't have one in mind, but I thought, hey, let me write sort of like a prologue to this script as a short story and establish some IP because IP, uh, intellectual property, is king in Hollywood, right? And that's the kind, that's what Hollywood is looking for. And yeah, short stories are IP, just like a novel is IP. So while we were working on the screenplay, I broke off uh, a prologue that had been implied by the script, but that we never really leaned into that deeply as a short story. So we have the short story called Caretaker. We have the script called The Keeper. And now there's about to be a graphic novel called The Keeper. And, and think about it, that we could take that script and turn it into a podcast. Yes. Or it might turn into um, a, 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 a series. A, a, yeah, a, a television series. We thought about how we could consumably turn it into a television series. But it's the same idea, you know, yes. the, the way, you know, and, and but we pitch that idea differently. Talk about, you know, what, what is your pitch for that idea, T? The elevator pitch? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Uh, an eight-year-old girl who's been orphaned and goes to live with her frail 
grandmother discovers that her grandmother is dead and she's afraid to tell authorities, but her grandmother conjured a creature to take care of her. I mean, that's not, that's leaving out some bits. Uh, usually the elevator pitch is about a sentence. I mean, the other part I would say for that is that she faces the dilemma of whether she continues to stay in hiding with this creature's care, or is she becoming the monster as the creature's appetites grow more and more deadly to the living things around her? That works perfectly well. I, I yeah. would tend to say, that a grandmother con makes a deal with a demon to care for her granddaughter after her own death. That's that's hot. That's you hot. And, and so it's but it, once you have those basic polarities, if you need to do it in a, a graphic novel, then you are the the writer director. The artist is the director, special effects guy, art director. Um, and you have to think about how do you visualize as much of this story as possible without dialogue or or narrative voice if you write it as a script it's the same issue you know scripts and graphic novels very very close if we were going to do this for a a radio script then you have to figure out how do you turn all of this into sound all yes. you have is sound what does the creature sound like sound and silence that's all you've got yes. so it's both you know dots and dashes plus the tonalities you know like chinese um that 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 you have you can you can have sound effects you have the actors speaking you know words in different ways in a uh you know with different intonations and different subtext in a graphic novel you might be able to change the thickness of the line or the type of type to suggest various emotional states and so forth but you're you're more limited with with a movie there could be a dozen things happening at the same time you know five different people doing five different things in a frame at the same time there's music playing at the same time they're talking about different things at the same time you have sound effects at the same time that there are special effects going on in the background so you have layers and you get to think about what is it that that you're doing and it, it is i would consider screenwriting to be a level of difficulty above writing short stories and novels although the best short story writers and novelists are just as good as any screenwriter if it, it's because there's a lot more money at stake i think that there's a lot more competition and you need to have a different set of skills at unconscious competence to get into that game yeah, a line of dialogue or a line of exposition carries so much more meaning in a script because there's so much more implied uh, and you don't have 30 pages to get in a character's head. Uh, when, you know, one exercise I would suggest for a lot of listeners, let's say you're working on a novel in progress. In life writing, we definitely encourage whether you're a prose writer or a screenwriter to start short. Right. So we don't say drop your novel and never look at it again. But an exercise I have given many, many students, I taught in the MFA program at Antioch University, Los Angeles for 10 years uh, and also briefly in that screenwriting program. And what I have often said to students is, oh, this is so interesting that you have this long work <laughs> that you've been working on for years. But for purposes of this class, I'd love you to bite off a piece of this story a piece of the script as a standalone short story, very similar to what I did with The Keeper, right? And and there are a lot of choices you can make about so when you, where when you, you write that story. When you take a chunk out of a novel and turn that into a short story, can you talk a little bit about your process there? How do you go from something being a chunk to being a complete creature unto itself? So, you know, sometimes it's literally a scene from the novel that you create an arc for, or that there's already an implied arc so that it can be standalone. I did that for the reformatory. My novel, The Reformatory, which is about a haunted boy's prison in Florida in 1950, isn't coming out. Well, that's until... another thing that we have going on. Right. right. That's another thing. That, oh that's, my God. that's not coming out until next year. But back, I think in 2019, because I spent seven years working on this novel back in 2019, again, I wanted to establish my intellectual property, my IP, my stamp, my stank on my story. So I published it in Boston, uh, the Boston Review. And instead of doing what I did with The Keeper, which was to create a scene out of whole cloth that was just implied by the novel, I took the scene that was really the emotional core of why I wanted to write it. Like almost the point of the story is when my protagonist is sent to get a whipping in a whipping shed called The Fun House. And it's in that moment that he realizes that the ghosts he was so afraid of are not 
what he truly needs to fear at this place. And then in fact, there's a hopefulness in knowing that there's something else after we die. It's like he has this moment of great terror and fear and then magic and wonder all in one scene. And that was a story I broke out for the Boston Review. So you, uh, so you can find uh, an emotional turning point for your characters, but very often the easier thing to do is either a prologue that is implied in your story that maybe you didn't delve into, a piece of backstory that you've mentioned in passing, but never really leaned into. Um, that's what I did with The Keeper. So for, for Caretaker, which is the short story uh, implied by The Keeper, I created a fake prologue, like the baby. We, we, we have a glimpse of a baby in our script, but in the short story, it's like, well, what happened to this baby? What, what, what happened to the baby's parents? <laughs> and why was the baby alone with the keeper? And, and boom, there it was. And so if a novel can sprawl, a short story needs to focus on a single major emotion, a single major turning point. Yes. A, a moment in time where something happens that changes the life of a character or defines that character in a very specific way yeah it, it's but then within that you have the same need for build up and breakdown of tension the motivation yes. reaction units the hero's journey within that story whose journey is it what is their challenge what do they do to try to deal with it what is the outcome what is their moment of greatest stress how do they have to transform to deal with it you still have the same story pattern, but in minute form, in, a, in atomic form. So when we say, when the, the six steps of the, of, the, of, the, of the life writing process, the you know, write a sentence a day, that is the smallest unit of work that will keep you moving forward, but the smallest unit of work that, that forces, that puts you into the game is a short story because we also ask you to not just finish it and rewrite it and research it but to research where you can sell it yes and to get used to dealing with the fear of submitting it and to start understanding the business of writing which is different from the art of writing if you don't get both halves of that you're going to be well frankly a wannabe you know that, that this broadcast is for people who want to get published whether or not you want to be a a professional writer or not i mean is is a separate question but i i feel like anybody who can use the english language could get published were they to focus enough anyone who is willing to work a lot harder than average and also really understand marketing and sales can probably make a living as a writer but they'd better be good at marketing you know there, there are plenty of people who aren't terribly good writers who really know how to market their stuff if you're good at writing and marketing you have the chance to have a real success and then if you got struck by lightning and you're good at, and you're good at writing and you're good at marketing getting yourself out there you have the chance to become something something more than that we can't nobody can guarantee you that but i do feel like what we're trying to do is to show you what can be guaranteed and i'm willing to guarantee that people can get published if you if you feel like you would like to see your work in a in a magazine someplace you know, and be able to point at that and say, that's my work. That much we can offer you. And and if you're already published, then publishing uh, longer and longer works yes. or bigger and bigger markets. You know, there's always a, a point on the path ahead that we're looking toward. I know I have that point I'm looking toward and Steve does too. Absolutely. And uh, some of you are probably a little bit nervous. I know I also was too. When I wrote my novel, The Between, it sat in a drawer for nine months after it was rejected for the like by one person. I think I sent it to an age a contest and it was rejected. I was like, oh, I guess I'm not ready. And for a lot of writers, they never even get that far. I'll tell you a secret: losing years and years to a long work in progress that never seems to get finished is a way of avoiding rejection, right? So that idea of writing short stories, yes, you can practice beginning, middle, and end to get that discipline so that the longer work can get finished you you know now you know what it feels like to complete something it's a great feeling and let's apply that feeling to longer and longer works but also it forces you to sort of reckon with the idea that maybe you are afraid to submit because short stories don't take that long to write so now it's finished now you know, what do you do i, I the, the worst case of this was somebody i knew in college uh, this person uh, knew that I was a writer and they said they had an idea for a story. I said, great. They mentioned a little bit about it. I said, great. 
A few weeks later, I asked how the story was going. They said, well, it's, it's, it's going well, but it's getting longer. I think it's going to be a, a novella, a novelette. And I said, oh, that's fantastic. A couple months after that, I asked how that was going. They said, well, it's, it's still growing. I really think I've got a novel here. At this point, I'm starting to feel a little funny about it. And I said, oh, great. I waited for months to say anything else. And when I finally inquired... Um, they said that, that the story was so sprawling, they think that it's going to be a trilogy. By this time, they were out of college. We weren't even in college anymore. Um, many years passed, decade passed. I found myself traveling in the part of the country where this, my friend lived. And uh, my wife at the time and I stopped in to say hi to this person. Um, and very regretfully, I finally asked, well, how's the trilogy going? And they said, well, I kind of got tired of it and I put it away. Uh, but after a while, I got this new idea that's really great and I started writing it. it it's, I think it's going to be a fantastic short story, except it's getting a little long. As you can probably imagine, I will never ask this person about their writing again. They don't want to be a writer. They want to have fantasies about how wonderful their ideas are, but they don't want to test themselves against rejection. And so they're actually denying themselves the emotional strength that would have enabled them to take their dreams and turn them into realities. And so if, if this is your problem, if you're dealing with fear and you're writing short stories, you won't be able to submit them. And you, and within weeks, you will know about a problem my friend from college had not been able to face in over a decade. And if you understand that you have to deal with fear, now you can say, how do I deal with that fear? And of course, you could go to our own Warrior's Journey course, or you could find any number of other tools. We don't care whether or not you use our tools. What we care about is, can you please find a pathway that works and, and get on that pathway and start developing your dreams, please. Uh, T, your, your sound is off. Sorry, words, bud. <laughs> it's important to note that very often uh, writer's block is just fear. Feeling locked into one kind of writing is fear. Like I only think in novels, for example. Well, that may be true. And there are certainly writers who learn how to write writing novels who have done that successfully yeah. without writing short stories. But I found it very helpful to write a bunch of short stories before I started working on the between. And it, it, it don't, it, it don't hide behind that feeling of inflexibility because that inflexibility could hurt you. It could keep you from getting a check, you know, it like, for instance, I'll give you an example we, uh, Steve and I wrote scripts for an anthology film called Horror Noir that was on Shudder and AMC. And we have had to fight and we still have to fight to be attached as writers to these projects. There's a big difference between what you get paid if someone just options your story and someone else adapts it. And if someone options your story and you adapt it. Big, literally big difference. A, literally a six figure difference. It's a big, big difference. Yeah. Right. So to me, that's what I was working for all this time, you know, like writing spec script after spec script and, you know, writing. I assume you've got to have the belief that you can learn anything you focus on. That way, if you believe that, then you're not going to be afraid to look at yourself and say, what skills am I lacking? Because, you know, if, if you don't want to look at it and say, I suck at X, Y, and Z, and I need the whole alphabet, then e e what you're doing is you're afraid, if I face the reality that I'm not good enough now, that means I'll never be good enough. As opposed to, if I face the reality that I'm not good enough now, I can acquire the skills necessary to get the rest of the way there. Um, we some of Go ahead. No, I was just going to say, some of this is planning for the long game, right? Yes. Because there was a All big... Of it is big gap between when I got that opportunity at Shudder and when I started practicing screenwriting. And there were some days Steve was joking with me about some bad dialogue. I wrote, you know, in an early script uh, years ago, <laughs> too bad, so sad. You know what? I'm going to put that in another script in your face. I was learning. <laughs> but, I dare you to. <laughs> but in any case, 
sure, it's you're going to feel like you suck at first, you know, sure, the feedback you get at first will be that you have a long way to go. Well, duh, especially if you're just starting out. Uh, but I will tell you this, if you are trained to uh, write stories in any other kind of medium, it is the building blocks that will help you leapfrog ahead of people who've never tried to do any kind of writing and are trying to learn screenwriting. I mean, sure, there's some bad habits that prose writers have to unlearn when they're writing scripts, but that's that's a lot easier than having to learn what is a story, right? Well, that, uh, what's <laughs> even worse is that whose advice do you follow? You know, there are writers who are professionals my attitude is always find somebody who's done it and model them that's that's my my go-to no matter what the problem is um but you, you go to writers groups and nobody's publishing that writers group you know and they will just sometimes they'll tear you apart and they'll give you beliefs that don't work you know values that don't work how about if somebody in that group won uh an award of some kind but is never published they might try to actually get you to, to they might actually denigrate the, the idea of publication or making a living. No, no, no. You should, you know, writing should be this pure thing, completely separate from the from the question of money. So you end up spending your time flipping burgers during the day and writing at night, as opposed to writing all day because you actually wanted to get better. So you actually thought, under what circumstances can I spend the maximum amount of my time writing? Oh, if I'm making enough money to substitute for the check I'd get flipping burgers. Yeah, sometimes we denigrate people who are highly successful in a financial way, like, oh, they're best-selling authors. Oh, that's a very popular movie, uh, as if it's somehow inferior artistically to, to make ourselves feel better about the fact that we're not the ones who wrote that movie, or we're not the Absolutely. ones who got that seven-figure uh, well, book contract. William Shakespeare is considered as highly as any writer in the in the English language by virtually all critics, and it is very obvious. Man wrote for money. He wrote for money. To the, as a matter of fact, he wrote bespoke. I mean, he 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 let the, the the Queen give him an assignment to write the Merry Wives of Windsor in something like six weeks. You know that the, the idea of making money for your work has nothing to do with the quality of your work. It has to do with your level of creativity and commitment to within, you know, be like Fred Astaire. Within the, the limitations of the stage that he is filmed on, he found a way to create great art every time. If you if you that is your commitment to create art and then to communicate it, you're going to be able to flow into any opportunity that comes along at any length in any media, possibly in any genre, because you understand writing, you understand creativity. Yes. Yeah, so if 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 you've heard the Hollywood horror stories, you've heard about like writers' rooms and situations where where you think, oh, I'm glad that wasn't me. Then maybe you don't want to be a screenwriter. But learning how to write screenplays, I think, is very, very helpful for all writers because MFA programs under teach story structure. They under teach plotting, in part because sometimes those instructors attitudes about what it means to be a commercial writer have seeped into the classroom. And even unconsciously, you have absorbed those attitudes so that you don't really understand how to move a story forward. You don't know how to create a sense of propulsion you know, and momentum. I a and thing that I, I have to say, if you are studying writer writing with someone who has not published, how can they teach you how to be a published writer? I mean, what is the likelihood that they have justified their lack of publication by ennobling it? I mean, the chances are they literally don't know how to help you get there. And they may very well have attitudes that are contrary to the attitudes that you need to succeed at this thing. Now, luckily, there are a lot of published writers who work in MFA programs. Find one of those. Yeah, Please. absolutely. Writers. Or... And, and so, so, or, or you can go, well, I, it sounds like you're trying to transition. I wanted to finish. Absolutely. My, my thought. Finish your thoughts and then we'll transition. I wanted to finish my thought, but it, so it may be that you're looking at it saying, well, I don't really want this. I don't really want that. But if there's any part of you that goes to a movie theater or streams something and says, oh, I could have written a better script if I knew how to write scripts <laughs> uh, or you well, listen to the to, people who do the, I've got this great idea. You write it. And we'll split the money. Right. Or, or you listen to a, a narrative podcast. I love scripted podcasts. I can listen to them when I'm in the kitchen driving. It's, it's, it's very absorbing because you're in the story. The sound is all around you. You're in the room with the characters. It's very intimate. If you've ever thought, Oh, I, 
I, I wonder how people do that. Well, guess what? There's a way to learn how to do that. There's a way to learn how to do that by, by studying it, by researching it, by listening to them, frankly, uh, in a lot of cases. With scripts, there are all kinds of scripts available free online, especially during Oscar season. You find these free PDFs uh, popping up online where you can read award-winning or award-worthy scripts after you've watched the movie, as we recommend, as Brian Fuller recommended. That is a great way to learn screenwriting. You can, you can do it. It's just a matter of overcoming the part of yourself that is intimidated by the mystery of not having done it before. I've never done a graphic novel. I've never done a scripted podcast. Well, yeah. Okay. I had if you think, if you think maybe I'm not creative enough, you're missing the fact that every single human being goes politely insane every night. That in one way, creativity in the arts is just thinning the wall between the conscious mind and our unconscious dreaming state. It's being able to dream and then type the dream, you know, out, you know let the dream flow through your fingers at a typewriter or at a, at a word processor. And then you work on structure so that the rewrite of that dream that you that you put out there gets better and better and better. You start dreaming better and better and better. And it's, you know, it's not literally dreaming while you're asleep, although it is for some people. I have I have writer friends who literally will write f finished stories from their dreams. Most of it's, it's kind of going into a dreamy state where we know that there are elements we want and then we let ourselves kind of get, you know, a little fuzzy headed and think about how these different ideas might grow together. Yeah. You have to believe, you have to believe in your creativity. You have to believe that stories will, will not just appear to you as novels if you start reading more short stories, right? right? If you, yeah, that you can absorb lessons from screenwriting by reading other people's scripts. And don't worry about where you are now. This is very, very important. It sucks to be starting out with something new. If Try. you made a commitment you know, the, the life writing process is you write a, a sentence a day, you know, write one to four short stories a month. You finish what you write uh, and submit it. You don't rewrite except to editorial request. You read 10 times as much as you write and you repeat this process 100 times. If you, not a single student who has followed this process has written more than about 25 26 stories before they before they got their first publication which means that if you write two stories a month you'll you can go from zero to having your first publication on average within the first year and if you sell that story for you know 350 bucks you have just gotten back everything that you paid for the an entire year of life writing premium one short story you know, sold will pay back the entire year. Do you understand that? Because what Snyder and I make make our money. We pay our bills with Hollywood, you know, and writing books. But so we were able to get the price of the program down much lower than other other fine writing instructors. I mean, you, if you take a look at the you know, talk about some of the some of the things that we have in that program too. Well, we have everything from videos that are lectures. Uh, I gave a lecture at the Geneva Writers Conference on characterization. So there's a video and PDF of that lecture on characterization. We cover almost every subject you can imagine, writing through grief, uh, screenwriting principles, if you're transitioning from prose to screenwriting, um, I mean, there's just so much practices. Tactics, strategy, philosophy, the writer's, the every writer's life. week. Every week you'll hear from us. We you know, and then every month we do a life writing hot seat where we take short stories and short film scripts from students and analyze them live on Zoom for the entire for the entire group so that you can actually see how these thought patterns come out. Neither one of us do coaching writing coaching anymore. We literally can't afford to. But the so the only way we can communicate with people is through these classes through those zoom calls and between the the personal attention the weekly uh, weekly writing prompts you know if you will bring writing one sentence a day if you can promise to write at least one sentence a day what we're promising you is we're gonna we can turn you into writers if you will actually do the work and you could spend 10 times as much as we charge and not get what it is that we have because we've actually been there and we actually care passionately 
about your being able to, you know, if, if you want to be a writer, you're our tribe. It's as simple as that. You're just like us. When I talk to you, I'm talking to the younger me. I'm saying the things that I wish to God somebody had said to me when I was 15 years old, 20 years old, 25 years old, so that I could leverage my energy and my optimism more efficiently. This podcast is a peak at the way we conduct our Life Writing Premium course, but it is not the same as the course. And I think it's clear that uh, I want to make it clear so people understand that it can be really tough to keep up momentum with your work and your writing with everything else you have going on in your lives. All of us need reinforcement. I have mine living in my house with me. <laughs> so to keep me honest and keep me on track. But in addition to this podcast, which is just sort of skating on the surface, the Life Writing Premium course lets you dive in more deeply and it's at your own pace. It's not overwhelming. I mean, there's a beginner's version and an advanced version, so you can pace yourself according to how much time you have that week. The beginner's week. version is just do it, write a sentence a day and watch one of our videos every week. That's it. Right. But now, if you want to go dreams worth to you, I mean, that the part of you that that dreamed of being a writer when you were a kid, that part is still inside you. I don't care what you do for a living now. You know, the average television is on for more than 20 hours a week. You know, you only need an hour or two to 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 move forward, to write those short stories. We want you to have that, don't you? You know, wouldn't you love to be able to hand your mom, your dad, your kids, your husband, your wife, your friends, a, a book, a magazine that has one of your stories in it? Can you imagine the fun of that? And then once you've done it, you can decide, well, it cost me this to do that. Do I want to do more of this? Yes. Well, you'll have the path. No. Well, at least you did it once. You Some of you... Yeah, some of you have maybe already even been through an MFA program and you're still paying for that, or you've considered going into graduate school and you're appalled at how expensive it is. Well, you know, you're getting people who have taught at the graduate level, at the college level, yes. who are at your fingertips, but you don't have to pay those thousands and thousands of dollars to take those expensive classes or tear your hair out trying to find an appropriate writer's group because we've already got a group selected for you. We have a social media group that you become a part of as soon as you join Life Writing Premium. We have the hot seat where you can get feedback the way you would in an MFA program. Uh, and it's and it all in a subscription system that is, it would be worth $100 a month, but we only charge $27 a month for that. Absolutely. And you, you have a choice to make. You can keep going the way you've been going. And if you like where that's going to get you, fantastic. Keep it up. But if you don't like the direction you're going in, you want something to help you change, this is it. This is your opportunity. You go to, to lifewritingpremium.com and check out what it is we have. And you try it for, for three months. Give it three months. I mean, you spend more than that on, on lattes in a, in, in a month, I mean, sushi in a night. You know, what is your writing worth to you? What are your dreams worth to you? What we're trying to do is, you know, frankly... You know, we're a couple, because we focused our entire lives on this, we're a couple of the most successful writers on the planet. Not because we're smarter than you or luckier than you, but just because we directed more of our time and energy. And also we got, we did get lucky in terms of the quality of teachers. You're talking to, to you know, published writers who, who disabused you of the notion that genre is inferior to anything. You know, I had Larry Niven and Ray Bradbury and Harlan Ellison as friends to encourage me. You know, we're just trying to pass this on as Absolutely. rapidly as possible. Free of genre bias. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Completely. You know, In fact, we just, there's... We just want you to be happy. No reason you can't write whatever kind of genre you want to write. Don't listen to... Uh, well, we're not interested in agents and marketers who are telling you only do this or only do that. We are really only interested in helping you be the best and most fluid writer that you are capable of being. And that's what the Life Writing Premium Program is about. So like Steve said, check it out at www.lifewritingpremium.com. And we'll look forward to seeing you pop up in our hot seats and our uh, in our social media Absolutely. page. Absolutely. And until next week, you know, we would like you to remember to be the hero in the adventure of your lifetime. And to remember that art is life. Right, the story of your lives, people. Thank you for tuning in this week, everybody. Bye-bye. See you next time.